record. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and I have my co-host, Wendy Perry. We just got back from our conference last week, which was in Houston, Texas, and it was called Revealing Unseen Child Abuse. It was a symposium that had some amazing speakers like uh, Dr. Jennifer Harmon and Wendy, who else? Uh, well, I made a presentation. I gave a presentation about getting parental alienation education into schools, and uh, that seemed to be pretty well received. And something that I thought was really interesting, when I gave my presentation, I asked the audience how many of them were alienated parents who had had issues in school related to parental alienation. And I thought, you know, maybe a few people would raise their hands pretty much everybody in the room raised their hands. That was really, really interesting to me and, and really just confirmed to me the importance of getting parental alienation education in the schools. Um, but yeah, it was Dr. Jennifer Harmon and uh, Jaina Haney, who is an amazing therapist, uh, who is doing a lot of important work here in Texas. And Dr. Daniel Fox, mm -hmm. a personality disorder specialist and wow he was incredible he was so much incredible information because you know we always talk about narcissists and bipolar in the world of parental alienation and he really spelled it out in detail you know what is narcissistic personality disorder and um, bipolar and also you know when is it not? When is it just that someone just has some of those characteristics, but they aren't necessarily a narcissist? Um, but besides having so much great information, I just have to say he was so entertaining. I mean, he's I really, he's a great, great presenter. So it was a really, really excellent conference. I, I, I was thinking, um, he had quite person, quite the personality himself. <laughs> he was just, it was so amazing. This is what I took from it is there was just so much love uh, in in the space with all the different presenters and the participants because the thing is is this is a serious topic and it's something that just breaks the hearts of everybody that's in the room and everybody that's in the room whether they're a parent who's being targeted or they're a counselor or a speaker this isn't this was an act of love so we all it was just so much love and camaraderie in the space which uh which is great considering it's such a serious topic i agree with you i think the atmosphere was it was really just very calm and very compassionate and kind it was just a really really great atmosphere and, and everyone said that they felt that they felt it was a really positive atmosphere and a really caring um, experience. So it was, it was great. And uh, they will be having another conference next October. So just if people have an interest in that, the organization is Children for Tomorrow. That's the host organization. Okay, so Wendy, who's, who do we have as our guest today? Well, today on Custody Matters Live, we have a very special guest. Our guest today is Jenna Noble, and Jenna is a wife. She is a mother of three and a stepmother of two children. She has fought alongside her husband, who was completely erased from his children's lives for over 18 years. She experienced complete erasing for 10 years, no contact at all, an order for reunification, a protective separation, and ultimately the death of her stepchildren's mother. Her husband's own family aided in the alienation of his children. Jenna has a unique perspective as the stepmother that watched the man she loves be systematically destroyed all because he left an abusive relationship and he refused to continue to support the dysfunction in his own family. So we've got a lot to talk with Jenna about and uh, also, Jenna is a coach, consultant, mediator, and the owner of Pathways Family Coaching. So, Jenna, welcome to Custody Matters Live, Thank and um, for being willing to share your story with us today. And there's, like I said, there's a lot to talk about in, in this. From your family's been through so much, and your husband, and you, as his wife, and the kids. So, um, I, I guess let's kind of start at the beginning. How did you meet your husband? And when you met him, did you already know about parental alienation or was this a whole new dynamic to you? 
Huh, good question. So I met my husband, <clears throat> excuse me, long before we were been dating. I think I met him when he was like 15 or 16 years old. Um, yeah, and, and basically we didn't start dating till many years later. When I was 18, I moved to the UK. Uh, he's a couple years younger than me, so <laughs> he was still in high school. And while I was in, in the UK, living live life, he um, got a girl pregnant in high school. And he had beautiful twin girls because of that. And that's where the story really begins um, when I returned, right? So I think my husband and I reconnected. Uh, his twins were about six months old when I moved back to Canada. And uh, we, we reconnected very quickly and started a relationship. He wasn't in a relationship with the mother of his children anymore. Um, and I mean, day one, it was total chaos. Um, I didn't really know what I stepped into. I had no idea. I actually didn't figure out probably for about 10 years what alienation really was. I knew I was going through chaos and that my husband was, but um, we didn't know what, what we were up against. So he was really dealing with alienating behaviors uh, from the kid's mom from the very beginning, from the time they were born, it sounds like. Um, yes, even, even before they were born, because um, she was planting seeds of doubt about the paternity of the children, which really messed with my husband's head as well. So did he have to um, establish paternity? Um, yeah, that's a complicated matter. So to make it short and sweet, um, when the, the children were born, he did ask for a DNA test, which he refused. Um, he brought his concerns to his mom, who total side topic, alienated him from his own mother, which he discovered through this process. Uh, and her response was, you screwed up, don't be like your dad, who as an alienated child that my husband was, that was the worst thing he could have heard because he despised his dad at that time. Um, so he stepped in with doubts and did what he thought, you know, that he should do. Um, he moved forward and pushed away his doubts and, um, it wasn't till I think the girls were 15 that he finally got a DNA test. So he had to fight in the courts for over a year for that. Um, and it was many times fighting with the mother to agree to this. So it was a long, lengthy process to find out the truth. Wow. Now you said um, in your bio that there were, there was 10 years of no contact. Yeah. And what time period was that as far as the girl's age? You said the, it's, the twins are girls. Yes. Yeah. Both I girls. Um, so I think they're around two and a half, maybe just about three years old. And my husband called one day and the phone was disconnected and they were gone. Yeah. So she found out shortly before that, that we were engaged, um, which I think was a big trigger. And she very quickly found herself someone to marry. It was very, very quick. And, um, you know, she found this man to step in and be dad. And that was the point where complete erasing happened. Yeah. So we didn't know where they were for 10 years. Wow. So she actually went into hiding with the girls, uh, basically. Yeah, to a degree. Um, they moved, I think, uh, homes about 21 times, to my knowledge, um, in different provinces in Canada, um, different cities. And I think they attended about 13, 12 or 13 different schools. So it was just constant chaos, constant moving. Um, we did hire a private eye when the girls were seven years old. And here's a big piece of the story that was used against us. Um, for a long time, we just couldn't afford to fight this, right? We were a really young, young couple that we had, we were, had our own family we had started. We had little kids at home, just could not afford it. My husband was going through school at the time. So we saved for many years to just get enough for a retainer. Um, the lawyer, sorry, I keep saying um. <laughs> the lawyer hired a private eye, tracked her down in a small town, uh, served her with papers for a DNA test, um, requesting for you know recovery of child support if it turned out that these were not his children, because at that point they were going through you know child support enforcement, so they were just taking his paycheck. So he paid for many, many years, not even knowing if these were his kids or where they lived. And she very quickly responded to the lawyer and said, these aren't his kids, right? I'm going to, I'm, I'm cutting off child support. These are not his children. She named some fellow um, saying they're, they're his kids. And 
my husband and I had to have a really hard conversation and, and we knew there was still a chance that of course these were his children, but I mean, they were seven years old. And at the time we thought we were making the best decision by saying, we don't want to rip these kids' lives apart, right? They had a mother and they had a stepfather that they probably loved at that point and had no idea who we were. And we thought that leaving it until they were old enough to understand what had occurred was the best decision, mm -hmm. right? Looking back now, we didn't know what alienation was. So we, didn't, we didn't know that was a bad decision, but we thought we were protecting them. And then they disappeared again. Shortly after that, they moved house again and they were, they were gone. Was she, I'm curious if mom was um, actively alienating by um, saying disparaging words, how, how was she actively alienating other than contact blocking? So before they even disappeared, she started going by her new boyfriend's last name. Right. So my husband, they, they had my husband's um, na last name at the time, but she started using her boyfriend's instead. Um, uh, this is, this is kind of hard to explain because I don't really know for sure what happened. I only know what the twins have told me and that was, she literally erased them. Right. They would ask, I have this memory about, you know, this man and this woman sitting in my bed and talking to me and she would say, Oh, those were bad people. They were friends of mummies and they were bad people so we had to stop talking to them right so they really didn't know that my husband was their father they thought that their by their sorry their stepfather was their biological father for many years of their life um and they did repeat a memory to me of being in like a doctor's office or a pharmacy or something and them calling out their names with my husband's last name and them being very confused because they only knew themselves as their stepfather's last name right? But that was swept under the carpet that that was a mistake. So the first while from the sounds of it, I'm just going off of, again, what the twins have told me, she really did just completely erase him and his family supported that. I mean, they took the pictures off the mantle. They used to see my, my husband's mother. And when I asked them about that, like, how did you not know that your dad was your dad? They said, well, we thought she was just a nice lady. This is our grandmother who took care mm. of her. So it was quite crazy to hear all this and it wasn't until we re-entered their life that the i mean the active tactics i guess started where the stories the narrative was switched to he abandoned you and he didn't want you and um they're gonna kidnap you and the fear was driven and the guilt now you said that your husband's own family aided in the alienation and I'm really curious about that. I, I'm very blessed that my mom has always been very supportive of me, but I, I hear this quite a bit where um, the extended family members of the targeted parent will actually align with and help the alienating parent, which it just must be absolutely horrible to, to not have your own family support you and be there for you. Um, but so, were they aligned with her from the very start or or how did that happen or did they just feel like they had to do that to stay connected to the girls um what is your your take on that how that happened and 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 did that continue throughout uh, the entire time um at first it, it appeared to us that his mother just desperately wanted to have a relationship with her grandchildren and she was willing to do whatever she needed to do to make sure that her needs were met, right? She wasn't worried about the relationship between my husband and his kids. Um, I mean, through this process, like I said, my husband had discovered that his dad really didn't abandon him, but he was seeing the tactics and the things being said. And he kind of said to me one day, this, this is exactly what my mom did to me. This, these are the kind of things she used to say to be a, me about my dad. So he realized that he was actually alienated. Um, and once he realized that it was kind of like a domino, right? He started talking to me about growing up feeling um, really paranoid that everybody was out to get them and they had to protect their mom, um, you know, family members, they get in an argument and they would be erased from the family, right? So this was common. The alienation was common through his whole, his whole upbringing. Um, and she really pitted 
him and his sister and brothers against each other, right? I remember sitting in her living room one day and um, one of my husband's brothers was in a relationship. He still is. He's married with a couple of kids. And she was talking about how his wife had physically assaulted him. And I remember all the siblings and the mother laughing about it. And I, that's kind of when I was like, okay, something's really screwed up here. Right. Cause they kind of thrived mm -hmm. each other's pain together, but I see that was all orchestrated. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. She just, mm -hmm. mom is definitely the, the ringleader of the chaos and dysfunction. And the kids have all learned that they all hate each other. They don't talk to each other to this day. Um, yeah, she just supported, she supported. And then when, when the girls were seven, like I said, and we had hired that lawyer to go and, and then we ended up saying, okay, we have to walk away because she's saying they're not. Um, she actually then alienated his whole family for a period of years. And they were all mad at him. It was his fault because she stopped the contact between the families. But then we re so, contact. They all became buddies again and helped to, you know, destroy the relationship between my these kids again. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard so to. What, what was what I noticed from our conference that we went to last week? Some of the things that they spoke of is about it. It this alienation creates an, a generational cycle. And it must, and a lot of times when we find ourselves in an, you know, targeted in this situation, we look in our own lives, a lot of times it's, it's there, it's been present and it just builds upon itself until somebody says, well, wait a minute, we've got to stop the cycle. And it looks to, it sounds to me like Jenna, like that you got, you recognize that and it's about stopping the cycle for, uh, for the children. I hope so, right? Like my husband and my, our three children that we share together are like happy, thriving, and I know we've ended the cycle for them, right? Um, for his twins, I don't know if necessarily if that's true because they're still caught in this chaos. And um, I mean, they're at high risk of being alienated or alienating their children, so. Now, you said when the girls, when the twins were seven, mm -hmm. you decided to step away for a while. But ultimately, um, you had a, a protective separation. Yes. And how how did that come to be? How did you decide to really pursue having a relationship with the girls and get to the point of getting a protective separation? And if you can share a little bit with us, what was that like? And what was the result of that protective separation? Yeah, I think this is really, really important to think about or to talk about because everyone thinks that this protective separation or reunification therapy is going to save their family. And that's really not the case all the time. Um, so my husband and I had spoken in great detail, obviously, when they were seven about, you know, what's this going to look like? Because we knew we weren't walking away forever. We just thought we were walking away from these little girls that couldn't understand the chaos and we wanted them to be, you know, more mature and mentally prepared and have a say quote unquote, have a say in what happened in their lives. So we had spoken about 12 or 13 being kind of the age where we would try to reinitiate and find them. Um, and I did. So my husband and I spoke about ways that we could find them. I found them on a social media website. I messaged them um, and I told them, you know, this is who I am. I might be your stepmother. Um, you know, your, your possible, possible dad, we had to be careful and say mm. sure that he was, we would both like to speak with you and, uh, you know, told them that no matter what the outcome is, that we love them very much because I mean, we had cared for and loved them until they were two and a half years old. And right away they phoned us crying and telling us about the horrific abuse they were enduring in their home and begged us to help them. And we had no intentions of really fighting her until they really were saying that they're being extremely abused and neglected and there's drug use. And um, I mean, my husband, of course, was infuriated to hear this and also felt incredibly shameful and guilty because he felt like he had left these children in this chaos that we didn't know that they were living in. 
Um, so we fought and very quickly it turned from the girls begging for help to we want nothing to do with uh, you. You lied to us. You abandoned us. She told us everything. We hate you. We have a dad. Um, but it would flip flop, right? Mm -hmm. One day, I love you and I want to talk to you. And, you know, I've always wondered what you look like and who you are. And then flip flop again to you stay away. You only want to make my mom's life hell. You're only doing this because you want to punish her. So, I mean, we fought through it. It was very confusing. And at the time, we still didn't understand why they were flip flopping so bad. We do now. But we fought and we fought hard. We went through mediation, which didn't turn out. Um, we, so this is where, this is where I learned as a step parent what my role really well was. And I worked far too hard on my husband's behalf because I think this happens with a lot of step parents. We see our spouse drowning and they're so, they're in so much pain and they're so tired. They don't even know what to do next. So we step in and, you know, we fight mm -hmm. and that's really what I did. And I phoned every professional that I could think of in this world and no one really had a clear answer for me, which was frustrating. So I took a little bit of all of their knowledge, the things that I thought were good and we hired a lawyer and I really did direct the step of the lawyer and we fought and he hated me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to work, Jenna. And I said, I don't care. We're paying you. You have to do this for us. And he was able to finally win a protective separation because we had a really awesome um, male judge who must have had children himself. And there was one point where the mom referred to my husband as an online predator. And the judge at that moment knew exactly what was going on. And he ordered uh, reunification, sorry, reunification therapy. Mm -hmm. But if I could get well, well-versed therapists, the point was never for them to help us. It was for them to really see what was happening. And they saw very quickly what was happening. And they made the recommendation of the court for the protective separation. Now, how old were the girls when you got that protective separation? And, and I have to ask, what were they like when you brought them into your home then? Because that, that seems like that would be a really, really, uh, you know, highly emotional uh, time to say the least yeah um, they were 15 years old so probably the worst you know when I look at alienated families now 14 15 16 is like the absolute worst of the worst so they were they were in the worst of the worst age um, they were ven venomous they were angry they were hateful um, our house is very calm we're a very close-knit family. There's no yelling. There's no chaos usually. And I remember that one of the therapists saying to me, Jenna, are you ready for this? And I'm like, oh yeah, I got this. And she was like, no, are you seriously ready for this? Because once they're there, they're there. And I had no idea. Yeah. It was, um, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. I ended up actually getting so sick, like physically sick, that I ended up in a psychiatrist's office. Um, because I couldn't even get out of bed. And this was after they left. My, uh, my body just crashed. And how old were, you said you and your husband had three kids together Yes. at that point. How old were they and how did they um, deal with this? Because that must have been really tough on them too. It was very hard. Um, they would have been, oh goodness, like 10, 11, 12 or something like that when, when the girls entered our home. And they were really confused. And I feel the worst for my son because my husband's twins have siblings with their mother as well and they're girls, right? So they've never experienced what it's like to have a brother. And my, my brother, sorry, my son is an incredibly affectionate, um, lovey-dovey kid. And he was so excited to have his sisters, right? These new sisters in their home. And... I mean, I suspect that the girls have been through a lot of trauma and they really didn't know how to respond to a male, which, which was their brother. And there was a lot of horrific allegations against him. Mm. Um, and they were very angry at him. They were better to my, the two others, but 
the, to the girls because they knew how to navigate a relationship with a sister, right? But my son, we actually had to buy him a lock for his door and tell him to keep his lo door locked at night. Um, wow. it, it was hard. Yeah. And the kids were definitely affected. My son was getting into fights at school and he said to me after, mom, I was so angry. Did, did the protective separation work in, a, in the sense that did the girls start, did they bond with you and their dad? Um, did they start to have, I guess I would say mental clarity? Uh, how did it, and was it a 90 day protective separation? Because that's usually the time that we hear about is 90 days. Yeah, so what was requested was 90 days in the beginning and it was extended. Um, uh, we, we had a protective separation all the way through 10 months. Um, and not just from their mother and her family, but all of her extended family, all of the twins friends, because they were totally enmeshed with mom too, and my husband's whole family. So really they left everything they knew and came to us who were total strangers. And, and we were all they had right at that point because they weren't allowed to talk to anybody. So yeah, it was 10 months. Um, they ended up running away. We can get to that later. But I mean, there was, there was lots of moments of clarity. Mm -hmm. right? But there was weeks where I saw these authentic kids and they were wonderful. Sorry, I get upset when I talk about this. That's there okay. Wonderful, wonderful kids when there was a, that authenticity that showed up. But people don't understand how powerful guilt is, right? So they would swing in our home too, right? One week, they'd be great. And the next week, they're like, I hate you. I don't want to be here. And you're not my family. And these aren't my siblings. And you made us come here. And, um, you know, they were worried about their mother. They were worried that she was going to die and they were never going to see her again. That they were stuck with us and they were going to get a call one day saying your mom's passed away. So, so, the so the loyalty bind really continued. And I know that part of the story is that she passed away. Mm -hmm. And was that, how long ago was that? How old were the girls when they passed away? And I think, you know, for a lot of alienated parents, the, the thought is, well, if the alienator passes away, then we'll all be free and we can all finally live you know, happily, and, and is that really the case, or does the trauma bond um, somehow continue, does the parental alienation somehow continue even after the alienating parent has passed away? Yeah, so I guess it probably sorry, depends on the dynamic within the family. Mm -hmm. Husband's dynamic was to the extreme, right? He literally had no one um, on his side except me and my family so the girls ran away when they turned 16 I'm from Canada and there's kind of a gray area in Canada that you are considered a you are considered an adult at 16 and you can basically do whatever you want but you're not legally an adult till you're 18 so when they left there wasn't much that we could do uh, so they ran to grandma, to my husband's mother, and she housed them and hid them from us. We didn't know where they were for, I think, about a week, and it was really um, hard. Um, and then they ended up with mom again. And quickly, it accelerated to the hatefulness consistently when they returned to mom. Um, mom did suffer from some, you know, drug and alcohol issues. And unfortunately, she, I don't know if she took her life on purpose or not, but she, mm -hmm. opened, and she passed away when they were, I think they were about 17 years old, about a year after they left our home. Yeah. So she left the twins and two little girls behind. Wow. This was the twins worst fear. We had a lot of conversations with them because I know she had tried to take her life before. And I, mean, I can't imagine as a kid, knowing that that's a possibility and wanting to protect your parent, right? And I feel there's immense amount of guilt because they weren't with their mom that night. They were actually in the city that we live in, partying with their friends and having fun. And um, I think they feel responsible for her leaving with them. So for- uh, I just like, this is, I can just imagine 
through their eyes, like this is going to, this is like totally alters them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. That not only have they been sort of parentified in, in her mental illness while she was alive, but now they're, now they'll forever feel responsible. You know, this is, this is actually happens more frequently than not. Mm -hmm. It does. That's why I think it's important to talk about it. Cause I thought we were alone in this. Um, you know, we always think we're alone in this. Nobody else can be experiencing. This is crazy. No one else could be going through this, but I have found several parents that something similar has happened. So I just want people to know that they're not the only one that has experienced this if they're listening to me today. How old are the girls now and how are they doing? Um, I, I mean, the whole family suffers, you yeah. know, your husband, obviously, and, and you and, and, and the kids that you and he have together. But um, the girls, how are they doing? Because it, it's, it's like I said a few minutes ago, you know, we kind of have, I guess we have this fantasy that, you know, when an alienator passes away, then we can all live freely and happily ever after. But I mean, it, that's really not the case. And the guilt that they feel that you talked about, which it's not their fault. No, of course. But, but how old are they now? And, and how are they doing? And, and are they, are they able to have a relationship now with their dad? Yeah, again, that's complicated. They just turned 18 years old. Right? So they're now legally adults. Um, so I'm going back to when I was saying it really depends on the family dynamic, right? So, um, Danica was saying before, this is, you know, a generational issue. So we're not talking about just one person, right? We're talking about a whole family system for generations and generations. So losing a parent that is maybe suffering from a mental illness and has alienating behaviors, it does not, it does not end the family dynamic right? There's always someone to step in and continue that alienation. And I don't think that their, their mother had even passed away for an hour when her sister was messaging my husband and saying, I'm now the point of contact, right? Mm -hmm. It's me now that you have to deal with. And his family. Yeah, because, the alien, because the alienator, she, she had a network. Yes. I mean, she had, she had a network of people helping her alienate. So I suppose when she passed away, they were like, okay, we got this, you know. Yeah. And I also recognize that most of her support network, they don't know that they're doing the wrong thing. They really do truly believe that she was a victim and that, you know, my husband is this horrific person that probably abused his kids and all this stuff. They really truly do believe it. These people are really convincing. So my heart actually hurts for them as well because they don't understand that they're enabling and supporting, you know, a delusional narrative, right? They're really supporting a delusion. They're really hurting these kids, but they think they're saving them, right? I don't think this is yeah. malicious intent. I think this is, you hurt my sister or you hurt my mother or you hurt, you know, these kids and I'm going to protect them from you. So are the girls um, able to have a relationship with their dad now? Or are they, are they seeing him and, and talking with him? How is, how is their relationship going? Um, yeah, that's, that's the, the sad part of it is. They're 18 years old. After their mom died, they, there was constant daily contact and it was positive contact. They weren't being hateful. And I mean, it was quite superficial, but it was still positive contact. Um, and unfortunately, months before her death, my husband had created a GoFundMe because the therapists that were involved had said that the, the twins had some serious psychological um, needs and they needed to go to a treatment center. And I won't get into details. Mm -hmm. um, we just couldn't afford to, to get them there. Right. So he started this GoFundMe. I think he posted it for like five hours. And then he said, you know what, I, I, I don't want to do this. And he took it down. So he thought. Um, so a month or two after their mom's death, my husband received a message, a horrific message from the twins, mother's sister, the, the new alienator, you know, telling him off and what a piece of crap he was and how dare he. And she took it to the twins. 
right? She took this GoFundMe to the twins. And um, I guess maybe that was the camel that bo- the, the, the camel, the straw that mm-hmm. broke back. They were incredibly angry to see this GoFundMe account. Um, and things got really hateful and went sideways. And the more severely alienated of the two, my husband continued to try to contact both of them lovingly, but she basically said, you know, just because our mom's dead doesn't mean we don't hate you anymore. Oh. The other one, um, she flip flops, right? If he tries to have a relationship, she's like, you're controlling, stay out of my life. This is my life. Uh, if he gives a little break or a space, she'll message and say, you know, you're not a father because you're not trying to talk to us. And then sometimes she'll reach out and say, you know, I'm in town. Can we see each other and love you too? So it's, it's a flip floppy situation, but. You can, I mean, you can hear their, their, their internal conflict, you know, I mean, they're so conflicted. Like, I love you, dad. I want to see you. No way. I hate you. Um, You know, I want to talk to you no, uh, you know, don't, don't talk to me or, you know, why aren't you contacting me? Stop contacting me. And it's, it's just really, really sad to hear that that internal conflict continues with them. Yeah. Are, are they in communication with their step siblings? Do they have any kind of relationship with them? Is that a possible uh, bridge right now? Like with, with our other children, you mean? Yes. Mm-hmm. No. So they, they posted um, International Sibling Day, and it was only pictures of their mom's kids. They've totally written our kids off. They don't recognize mm-hmm. the siblings. Uh, they've really tried to erase us from their lives, right? So you need to understand, too, that in these really severe cases of alienation where, where a parent is really suffering from a personality disorder or, you know, a mental health issue, a severe mental health issue, that gets transmitted to the kids right? We learn to regulate ourselves off of our children, learn to regulate themselves and learn, you know, coping skills and emotional regulation off of their parent. So if that parent doesn't know how to do that, they pick up those, they pick up that dysfunction, right? So, I mean, these girls are suffering with, you know, a possible personality disorder or maybe not diagnosable, but, you know, the inability to navigate relationships at the moment and attachment issues and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes until they want the treatment, right. Until they want to do the work themselves as parents, we kind of have to do the tough loving thing and say, you know, I love you no matter what, but there has to be boundaries too. And that's where we're at right now, right? There's boundaries around our home and our family and our kids, because we need to keep our family safe. Um, but of course we love them. They just have to need, they have to do the work. They need to want to. And that might not happen until their brain's totally developed, right? Until they're in their mid twenties. We don't know what that's going to look like. So now, um, as I mentioned in your introduction, you um, have a a coaching company, Pathways. And do you want to share a little bit with our viewers about that? And and what made you decide to to go into coaching? Um, Because, I mean, this is a really intense personal situation that you have and so what made you decide that you wanted to to stay involved and to help other people in that situation because like I said when my husband and I were seeking solutions and um, you know support from the top professionals and and it's not to bash any professional everyone's doing Mm -hmm. fantastic work in their own way you know what I mean but there was no there was no clear answers for us and it was very frustrating. And a lot of the mental health people, they didn't know what this was, right? And they get it, they get it really, really wrong. And the courts get it really, really wrong most of the time. And I didn't want, I wanted to turn basically everything we went through into something good, right? I, I say often, I wish I had a me, you know, 10 years ago or even in the reunification process when they were put into our house and basically the therapist said, you know, just give it time. Mm -hmm. There was no support. There was no one telling us, this is how you need to respond to stuff like that. We did it so wrong, right? They'd be angry and smashing doors and my husband would be yelling back. Our house was chaos. Mm -hmm. If I had me, 
and what I know now, helping us, coaching us while we were going through that, I think, I honestly believe that their mom would still be alive and those kids would be going between both of our homes. I do. I really truly do. I agree with you. I think that, you know, you know, we're in a lot of, you know, online groups where we discuss this. And I think a lot of alienated targeted parents believe, well, once you get the kids back in your house with you, then things just naturally work out. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, to your point, it's very important that you learn what to say and how to say it and, and how to react or not react, you know, depending on the situation. And as much as we would like to think, well, you know, love conquers all. And once they're in your home, you know, it's just naturally, you know, we're just going to love them through it. Um, yes, to a point, but still, and as you said, these are teenagers at this point, um, I mean, you really have to have some skills. You really need to know how, how to act and react and what to say and not say. So I think that it's great work that you're doing to, to help other families through that because, I mean, these are skills that people can learn and, and you need to learn. Absolutely. And to understand their perspective. We didn't really understand everything that they were dealing with. Um, and even from learning about personalities and disorders and stuff like that, you know, for, through that lens, um, you know, what's going on in their mind. So absolutely, it would be a very different story than it is right now. And you are writing a book, is that correct? I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So talking again about the, the child's experience, I think that the key to real solutions around this and getting important people to acknowledge what's happening and help parents like us that are suffering and the kids. Um, they need to hear from the children, right? They need to hear the children's stories, those adults that were once alienated, that are now reunited with their alienated parent, you know, how that affected them long term and what it's done for, you know, what it's done in their relationships and in their lives and what kind of behaviors they turn towards and what they really truly believed and wanted at that point. So I've been reaching out to alienated adult children, right? um, asking them to share their story with me. So I'm hoping in the end, it's going to be a book, a compilation of their stories. I think that's so important. I, I really think that the alienated kids are the, the best experts we have, you know, I mean, the talk about experts, the alienated kids are really, really the best experts we have. And it's really, really important for us to listen to what they have to say. And, and sometimes they say things that we don't necessarily like, we don't really want to hear, but we have to be open to hearing what they have to say. Um, yeah. They, they lived it, you know, they know it. And so it's incredibly important. And so how can people get in touch with you, Jenna? about your coaching and also if, if they want to talk to you about the book that you're writing, if they were um, a child of parental alienation, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Now they can email me at my pathways email. So it's Jenna, J E N N A at pathways, family coaching.com. Um, they can just put book in the, in the subject if it's regarding the book or whatever else they need to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm hoping it's hard because my husband's an alienated child, right? And he's only discovered this in the past, I don't know, six or seven years. And there's a lot of shame and guilt that's attached to that, right? So these kids, these adults that are coming forward and speaking about it, they're really having to fight, um, you know, a story of shame to be able to speak out. And that's why my husband isn't here today. We've had lots of conversations about, you know, I'm the one that's always talking and he's hiding and he's like, because I'm embarrassed. Mm. Right? I think someday he, he's kind of on that verge of saying, yeah, I'll let somebody talk to me, but there's so much shame that's put on these kids and it's not their story, right? It's someone else's story, but that's why this book's taking a long time because all those that have reached out to me and said, yeah, I want to share my story it's hard for them to share. It's taking time for them to, you know, send it to me or to say, you know, I want this out publicly because they feel a lot of shame and guilt. 
Well, Jenna, you know, it takes a lot of courage to not only go through what you've gone through, but to take it to the next level and become an advocate for others and kind of shine the light on a dark path for them. Yeah. Uh, so I, I thank you for being the one. Thank you. Thank you. I don't feel like there's an option. I think you guys probably agree. I don't feel like I chose this. I feel like mm -hmm. I have an option, right? Yeah, it's, it, it's really not a, something that I think any of us would choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I always say this, it's a labor of love. It really is. Um, to do this kind of work is a true labor of love. You do it because you love the kids and you want to see an end to this. So yeah, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And, and I really look forward to your book. Thank you. Um, I, like I said, I think the hearing from the, the kids of parental alienation is so incredibly important. So I really look forward to, to your book coming out in the near future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Is there anything that, that you definitely want to share with our viewers? Any message of hope or any information that, that you really want them to hear from you? Um, yes, that as long as your kids are breathing, there's hope, right? I don't, I, I know parents all the time are, are taking the things that they say personally and it hurts. I get how badly it hurts, right? When I hear the things they say to my husband or send me messages that are, that are horrific, it hurts, right? Even though I know where it's coming from, but we need to understand that it's really not personal and these children are struggling so bad and their behavior is a way of trying to connect with us, right? Even though it's negative, they are looking for a link. They're looking for a connection. So I say any message is a, is a positive message, even if they're telling you to F off and die, excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Behavior is a language and it's, it's seeking some sort of connection to you, right? So please don't ever give up hope. Don't ever stop trying. Be unconditionally loving. Don't expect anything in return from your kids, right? It's our job as parents to love our children. It is not our children's job to love us. I'm getting upset. <laughs> it's the truth. Yeah, and there are people out there that can help you navigate this, right? I said it before and I'll say it again. If I had a me 10 years ago, we would not be here, right? If there was a Wendy 10 years ago or a Danica talking, a lot of us wouldn't be here. So seek resources right and i know not all resources are good do your research don't just trust people right don't just mm -hmm. trust me. ask me lots of questions we need to learn how to be critical thinkers again um, because we're putting our lives our children's lives in the hands of people sometimes unknowingly right so ask use critical thinking ask questions um, yeah and 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 you know, if you are going to use a coach or someone to help you with a particular situation that you're going through, I always tell people, you know, go with, with who you feel comfortable with. You know, there are a lot of different resources out there now, a lot of different people. And sometimes people will approach me and say, hey, I, I might want to do some coaching with you. Um, and so we talk about it and I tell them, you know, this is, these are my areas that I work in. Um, you know, but whoever, if you don't choose me, that's okay. Go with somebody that you feel comfortable with. So to your point, do your research and, and go with whoever you feel comfortable with. And also take bits and pieces of information from the different experts that are out there. And, and you mentioned that earlier in the interview. Um, I think that, you know, we've got some really great experts out there right now. Um, and, you, you know, you don't have to um, subscribe to just one you know, study all of their works and take the bits and pieces from their works that speak to you and that you feel like can help you with your situation. Absolutely. And as parents, we know our children better than anyone. So if I'm coaching a client, sometimes the answer is, I don't know the answer. You know your kids, right? Mm -hmm. I give you advice, but you know in your gut what you need to do. You're always right, right? We second guess ourselves as parents and we don't need to. Okay. We <laughs> Someone's are knocking. I know. <laughs> it's been a busy. It's been a busy thing happening right now, and uh, with people coming in and out during <laughs> our interview. <laughs> My apologies. Um, okay, so Wendy, 
What is it that you usually say? All right. I love it. Well, I don't love it. It's not great, but you know, it's an important message. Turn around again. There you go. Parental alienation can happen to anyone. So it should matter to everyone. And we just want to thank um, Jenna so much for being on Custody Matters Live and thank everyone for watching Custody Matters Live and, and help us keep spreading that message. It really can happen to anyone. So it should matter to everyone. Yes. Have a great day and we will see you again next week. Bye guys. Thank you ladies.